All right, hello. Thank you everyone for joining us for our Winning a Federal Green Energy Recovery in the West webinar. I wanted to welcome you and explain that this webinar is being hosted by the Western Organization of Resource Councils, or WORK, which is a regional network of grassroots community organizations that includes eight member groups in seven states. My name is Kate French, and I'm a regional organizer with WORK, and you're also going to be hearing from Eric Warren, who does communications for WORK. I also wanted to provide some context for why we're putting on this webinar. As you all know, the federal government has enacted several emergency measures to respond to the COVID-19 crisis. Now, Congress is starting to consider legislation that will help our economy recover. And here we feel it is critical that we in the West speak up for a recovery that prioritizes clean and renewable energy that benefits everyone. So our fantastic group of expert panelists will cover how the pandemic has impacted the clean energy industry and how clean energy can be a cornerstone for a sustainable economic recovery. And we're going to provide you with easy action steps that you can take from home to help this effort. So our panels today are experts in different areas of the clean energy revolution. First, we're gonna hear from Mike Kruger, who is the president and CEO of the Colorado Solar and Storage Association. Then we're gonna hear from Susan Nadell, who is the Mountain West advocate for E2. Then Brett Isaac, who is a founder and co-CEO of Navajo Power. And finally, we'll hear from Lori Bishop, who is the representative for House District 60 in the Montana State Legislature. And now I'm going to turn it over to Mike to kick it off. Well, thank you very much. I, um, it's a real honor to be here. As was mentioned, my name is Mike Kruger. I am the uh, president and CEO of the Colorado Solar and Storage Association. I'm gonna kind of walk through a couple of the um, uh, things that are happening here in Colorado. Uh, up until about March 1st, we were jamming uh, in Colorado, we were adding about one job a day, every day, uh, for the last couple of years, uh, at least the last 18 months. Uh, the demand for solar here is broad, not only is it in the Denver and Denver suburbs, but over in Grand Junction, Southern Colorado, uh, in fact, even uh, some places that are traditionally a uh, more kind of coal-based or, or oil-based economies, uh, also we're looking at adding solar. And then COVID happened. And uh, we had about 7,000 people working directly in solar and storage. These are folks that are, you know, in one way or another, kind of touch a solar panel or touch a, a battery uh, as they go about their daily work. Of those 7,000 folks, we've had over 2,000 laid off or furloughed, uh, which has really, um, you know, been quite a hit to the industry. Primarily, those are focused on what we call behind the meter. These are the rooftop um, installations that you might see on a home or a business. Uh, many of the jobs originally uh, kind of went out the window were the, were the retail sales folks that did a lot of knocking on doors. Obviously, that's not uh, no longer okay in, in the COVID era. So they went, went uh, were, were initially laid off. And unfortunately, corresponding with the, with the change in the economy, we've seen a lot of decline in interest uh, from homeowners and businesses who right now are just trying to hold, hold on to their cash. And so we're starting to see more and more of our installers and some of the back office staff furloughed. Uh, which has been a real shame uh, because these are the folks that were, you know, earning a good living it, locally, uh, many of them living and working in their own communities. Folks are working on bigger projects, tend to have much longer timelines, 24 months, sometimes even as much as uh, 48 months, and they will, um, uh, so they've got a little bit of time and wiggle room within their timelines to keep working. Um, so those bigger projects are continuing. They, they had some hiccups, uh, primarily around, um, permitting, public meetings around uh, land use, but I will say that many of the jurisdictions here in Colorado have been really good about ensuring that um, those meetings, or at least those processes, the democratic processes continue. So we don't uh, see or foresee a lot of uh, uptick, or, or sorry, slowdown in the big, big projects. Many of the big projects are also being purchased by utilities. Utilities are pretty stable at this point. They certainly have seen a decrease in their sales, and there's certainly some folks not being able to pay their bills, but overall they're in a good place. Um, and so they're a pretty good partner. Um, the, uh, so that's where we're at. So there's sort of, you know, really the big stuff continues, the, the local stuff is where we've seen a lot of layoffs, which is unfortunate um, because the 
potential benefits of solar and storage are that you can't really export this work. Um, you know, you're not looking on energy being mined or uh, pumped out of the ground elsewhere and shipped locally. You know, these are all local jobs. These are folks that are uh, working in, in the communities they live in. And then you're also able to establish a tax base uh, from some of the larger projects like community solar or the really large scale projects. So you have a 20 year fixed revenue source right there in your community or within your space um, to help give back to the to the the local population on a regular basis rather than just sending your money elsewhere. Um, you know, we, we see that and then the, the kind of the knock on effect is that you have cleaner air and cleaner water, which is also nice. Uh, and I know certainly of, of interest to the folks on the call. Um, but there is really something to be said here in Denver, which where I'm at, where I'm at, uh, to be able to look out and see the mountains every day. There's not a brown haze. Um, it, there's no silver linings for COVID, but, but it is nice to certainly see the impact and we'll be able to imagine a future where uh, we, you know, we would have, um, we wouldn't have that problem on a regular basis because of a uh, greening of the uh, energy grid, as well as uh, auto transportation and and uh, buildings as well. And that'll be something else I'm sure we'll talk about. Um, I, I would, since this is a broad group, you know, really focusing on trying to make sure they have a big impact on the, uh, the federal conversation. We have seen three packages come and go that don't have any money or any interest or any uh, support for uh, clean and renewable energy. So I would definitely encourage folks to get on the, on the phone with their representatives, with their senators, and talk about the importance of in, in ensuring and encouraging clean energy. You know, one of the things that's happened in the last, say, four years, as the price of clean energy has dropped now, it is competitive solar, especially wind, uh, amazingly so, um, with general kind of dirty uh, energy. And, and on a sunny day, here in Colorado, there is no cheaper source of energy than solar. Um, same with a windy windy evening, we can't produce energy any cheaper than, than the windmills out on our Eastern Plains. Um, and so what we're seeing is this price is falling. So even recalcitrant uh, utilities like Tri-State, who you know, were firmly wedded to, to coal, have now seen the writing on the wall and the, ultimately the bottom line, say they're switching over. And so we expect to see gigawatts and gigawatts of solar and Solar installed in um, solar and wind installed in, in Colorado because the price is so good. That being said, there are policy supports that we do at the federal level that really support uh, the, the rollout of um, solar and storage, um, specifically the investment tax credit. So if you if you take one thing away from my talk here, um, it would be talking to your representatives and your your federal senators to say the investment tax credit for solar is vital. Um, it was 30%. Uh, you got 30% credit back on your taxes. Uh, last year, it's 26 this year. It's 22 next year. And then it goes to zero for residents. So it's a heck of a cliff. Um, and uh, it goes to 10% for the larger projects. But that, that percentage is, is quite a bit. That's often the difference between a homeowner being able to make that investment and not. It is, uh, for those of you that will be part of a system like here in Colorado, where you're going to be buying the solar anyway, you're going to be buying the wind anyway because of public policy, there is no real reason for there, for the federal, for you to pay more money, but instead for, uh, you might as well as get the 30% the discount. So, you know, there's really, a, it, it's a proven, it's the single best policy, and it's really something that's very simple. Federal government can do very well. So that would be uh, the big takeaway for me. My time is up. So let me hand back over to Doug. We're going to hear next from Susan um, Nadal from uh, E2. So um, Susan, I believe we're going to do some, uh, we're going to try to share your, yep, your slides. So if you'd like to take it away and introduce yourself, go right ahead. Great. Thank you. Those slides look good. Um, I am Susan Nadell. I'm the Mountain West Advocate for E2 or Environmental Entrepreneurs. Uh, next slide, please. For those of you who don't know us, E2 is a national nonpartisan group of business leaders who care about policy that is good for the economy and good for the environment. We got our start um, in California about 20 years ago, advocating for the first clean car emission standard in the world. Since then, we've grown to nine chapters stretching across the country from New England in the east um, down the East Coast as far as uh, North Carolina and then uh, across the country to Seattle, 
Washington and down to San Diego. So we, the Mountain West chapter um, focuses on um, the Intermountain States, and we started 13 years ago. Collectively, we have about 8,000 members and supporters across the country. Many of them do work in clean energy, but a lot work in other areas like real estate, investing, restaurants, and many other sectors. But what we do is put those business voices to work. We bring those business voices to the state and federal legislators, where they tell their story about the economic benefits of smart climate and clean energy policies. Uh, next slide, please. Um, one of the best ways we found to tell the story about the economic benefits of clean energy is to show how many people work in the sector, and it's a lot. For the past five years, we've been publishing Clean Jobs America and other reports, including state-specific reports, which we publish throughout each year. And our latest version of the Clean Jobs America report came out in April. And let me share with you about what we know about those clean jobs. Next slide, please. Let's start by talking about the size of the clean energy industry. About 3.4 million people work in clean energy in every state in the country. And I should say that these are before COVID-19. So these are uh, 2019 numbers. Um, that's more people than work as school teachers in America, that's more people than work in real estate, in banking, in farming, and also about three times more people than work in fossil fuels. On the left hand side, you can see the breakdown. Um, and about two thirds of clean energy jobs are related to energy efficiency. It is by far the largest sector, followed by renewables, clean vehicles, grids and storage, and clean fuels. On the right side, you'll see the clean energy has been on a terrific growth streak over the last five years, that's pre-COVID. Clean energy jobs grew at over a rate of 10%, while the rest of the economy grew about 6%. Next slide, please. These are jobs in every single sector in America. They are electricians, HVAC technicians, construction workers, upgrading homes and schools and offices, with their insulation, low E windows, and LED lightings. They're factory workers making Energy Star appliances. There are people making electric vehicles, engineers designing and workers installing solar and wind projects. Next slide, please. And there are jobs in every state in the country. Um, on the right, you can see that California leads, followed by Texas. And of course, there's the, the East Coast has a lot of uh, hot hot states with a lot of clean jobs. But it's important um, to note that there are clean jobs in red states, in blue states, and purple states. And on the left, I um, collected all the job numbers that we published in the Clean Jobs America report for the Mountain West states. And I will note that all this information is online and I'll give you links at the end where you can kind of study it and look it over a little bit more slowly. Uh, next slide, please. I'd like to now talk about what happened to this industry from COVID-19. We had our researchers, BW Research, take a look at the unemployment filings to figure out the effect of the nationwide shutdown in the, on this industry, or all these industries. We found nearly 600,000 workers in the clean economy lost their jobs in March and April. And it looks like it's gonna even get worse. BW estimates that the job loss by the end of the second quarter will be around 850,000. That's almost a third of the clean jobs that were in the country at the end of 2019. The largest job loss is in energy efficiency. Not surprising because uh, buildings and schools are closed and homes are off limits for energy audits and upgrades. But solar and wind also took big hits, some due to financing, some due to permitting issues, and some due to supply chain disruption. There's a whole bunch of reasons that are causing these problems. Next slide, please. Every state is hurting. Uh, California has the highest number of job loss. I mean, they have the highest number of clean jobs, so they have the biggest loss. But Georgia has the highest percentage of loss, which is kind of interesting. Um, and the job loss is spread across the country. 
Next slide, please. I put together um, next to the clean jobs that were in the Mountain West at the end of 2019, you can see the job loss both in percentage and um, absolute numbers. So you can see Oregon has the highest number of job loss and the largest percentage is in North Dakota. Next slide, please. So what are we gonna do about this situation? I guess this uh, heads back to what we were talking about at the beginning. How can we, um, how can we get America back to work? Uh, clean energy provides occupations in so many sectors, just like no, others, no other industry. Construction, manufacturing, energy, finance, engineering, all these jobs in every single state in the country. And remember, this sector was growing the fastest in the country. We know from history, clean energy is uniquely capable of leading America's recovery in post-COVID-19. After the Great Recession in 2008 and 9, no part of the um, 2009 American Recovery and Reinvestment Act was more successful than the 90 billion of federal investments in clean energy. More than 100,000 wind and solar and other clean energy projects were started bringing new investments and job opportunities to states across the country. Investments also led to the weatherization of more than 1 million homes, expanding energy efficiency worker jobs across the country. Federal investment leveraged approximately 150 billion in private and other non-federal cap capital for clean energy investments. This actually activity created nearly 1 million clean energy jobs. And along the way, consumers and businesses save billions of dollars. Our environment benefit and, and also the nation became more energy secure. We know there are no other sector that can restart the economy than the clean energy. And for the past six weeks, E2 has been taking our business leaders across the country to meet with our senators and representatives in Congress. And of course, that was virtually. We've had dozens of meetings We've been telling them we need to get these workers back to work right away. And we've talked about specific policies that you can see in the bottom left corner of this slide. And we also, need, we also know we need to focus on the future. We know we can build back better and we can build back faster in our economy with clean energy. And you know, why wouldn't we wanna do it in a way that is better and smarter? Um, we have uh, 200,000 miles of transmission lines. We can get those workers back up and modernizing them and uh, hopefully preventing some of the catastrophic fires that happen in California and other places across the West. We have uh, schools that are empty now. They could, not, they could be empty even in the fall, 133,000 schools. We could upgrade those for energy efficiency and make it healthier for students and teachers. Um, and then, of course, we can electrify buildings. We know that 40% of carbon emissions are due to our buildings um, across the country. And finally, we can, these, another example is electrify uh, transportation, car charging network across um, the West. We have um, Rev West, which a lot of Western states are part of. Um, we can keep doubling down on that. and. Um, perhaps electrify government fleets and put a lot of the um, clean transportation workers back to work. Next slide, please. So you, as I said, you can see all of our reports on our website at e2.org. And I look forward to continuing the discussion in the Q&A and I turn it back over. Thank you. All right, thank you, Susan. Um, and now we're going to kick it over to Brett Isaac of Navajo Power. Um, Brett, if you'd like to take it away, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, thank, thank you guys. My name is Brett Isaac. I am the CEO of Navajo Power. Uh, Navajo Power is a development company focused on developing large scale projects, but a bit about my history. I've been in uh, solar and particularly off-grid for about the last decade. Um, located on the Navajo Nation, we're, I'm from you know, northeastern Arizona, but um, we, we've been focused on 
converting our, you know, electrical, electrical, I guess, portfolio from fossil fuel based, you know, energy to renewables for the last decade. And one of the things that, you know, has come up in, in our conversations over the last decade is the need um, for the actual entities that will actually do this work, which, which led to the creation of Navajo Power. Um, one, one, um, one thing looking at, you know, uh, what, what has happened over the last few months is it's really highlighted deficiencies in, in a lot of structural infrastructure and things that have happened, particularly in the Navajo Nation, but in, in a lot of different areas. It's, it's highlighted like, you know, food sovereignty. It's highlighted energy independence. It's highlighted a lot of the things that we know are, are problematic for a lot of communities. And one of the things that we try to promote is this idea that, um, you know, we, we want to create some degree of sovereignty through economics, through energy independence, and also through, you know, uh, economic, you know, uh, opportunities that, that actually relate to local empowerment. And, and that's something that, you know, Navajo Power was created on. So Navajo, a bit of what Navajo Power is a public benefit corporation. And we have development projects in Arizona, New Mexico, Oregon, um, and a few other places that we're actually scouting right now. Uh, we've been in existence for about two and a half years. And one of the things that we're specializing is developing energy projects on tribal lands. And one of the reasons is because the initial surgeons, the initial, I guess, insurgents of energy with fossil fuels uh, focused on these areas, whether it be uranium, coal, gas, you know, they, they're all located in indigenous communities. And as they are all coming of age or, or aging out, um, we're looking at abandoned, you know, infrastructure. That's transmission systems, interconnection points, um, and facilities that could be converted into clean energy projects. And so looking at that over the last couple of years, that's where we focused our attention on bringing, you know, uh, opportunities Opportunities to these communities. One, to create jobs, to create economic independence. The other is to create momentum, you know, to, to actually capitalize on the economics. As developers, you know, we don't see a lot of new fossil fuel projects coming online. We see clean energy projects competing by the day that we are, we are getting more and more competitive and also getting, you know, to a point to where there, there really isn't a competition. You know, I think the other, the other, like a week ago, we saw like a $15 megawatt hour project in, in, in South uh, New Mexico, which is absolutely unheard of because coal in our area is still being purchased at $55 a megawatt hour. So we're seeing the economics play a larger part in what, what processes need to happen. And through COVID, you know, the understanding is, well, what's going to put us back to work quickest? And just, and just like the previous presenter said, you know, it's like, it's got to be things that are done on grander scales. And looking at the Southwestern grid in general, that's what we've been focused on, is how we can bring these opportunities to places that really need them, that already were in, in deficient areas, that put people to work, but also that, that have these subsequent opportunities. You know, we're also looking at electrification, um, for people that don't have it, you know, on the Navajo Nation, there's 15,000 people or 15,000 homes that don't have access to, to power and water, which is what spread COVID even more dangerously out here. It's because you have people that don't have access to the resources needed to just simply wash their hands or, or, or sanitize, you know, the, the food coming in. And so we want to be a part of that solution by we develop these large projects, but in my history, we also have to look at the people that have always been kind of overlooked in providing services and solutions for them. And so that's what we brought um, to, to, to the table is looking at these multiple layers of how we do projects. The other is, you know, local um, development is, is something that's really important to us. No matter where we go, you know, across the country, you know, the locals have to be the ones that to drive, support, and actually, you know, consent to what we do. I mean, we, we can't have projects that are confrontational anymore. You look across the country over the last decade, you know, you see protests, you see laws enacted to change how, like, people, you know, um, confront, you know, things that they don't want in their communities. 
we need to be more in tune with how developers and how regulatory entities actually interface so that these, these projects are more organic. And that's something we really pride ourselves on is we're not gonna build something people don't want. And we're also gonna include them in the process of how it gets built so they understand what it does, what the repercussions are, what we have to do coming out of it. And so, yeah, looking at the regulatory, like that, that's been essentially like where we've been focused on is creating these incentives and supporting these incentives that allow us to think about what the future holds for us. And, and the thing though is the economics are pointing in that direction. Really, we just need to tell, you know, we kind of need to get behind that momentum and, and actually drive it home because if we want these jobs, we want these revenues and we want to really turn our economy around, you know, that's going to be what actually does it for us is, is by supporting the people that actually do the work and that actually build these things because that's what this country was built on is people that do things. So thank you guys. I think I'm, uh, I might be out of time, so. All right. Um, and hopefully we'll get to hear more about your sweet projects during the Q&A. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, all right, we're going to kick it over to Representative Lori Bishop. Um, she happens to be my representative, but um, that is immaterial because she is a clean energy advocate uh, for all. So, Lori, if you'd like to take it away. Great, thanks. Um, I get the pleasure of getting to follow such a knowledgeable group and um, was excited to be able to join you today in part because it really helps me to learn too and to really think about um, how we do this. So I was actually even taking pictures during some of those slides, but um, I just wanted to talk to you about why this is important for state government, state budgets and economies, um, and why you as citizens are really uniquely positioned to be able to chime in. And then just talk about why this is an important moment to be able to do that and why even at the state level, we're still also looking to federal investment and continued policy to really support our work. So when we think about it from, you know, from a state like Montana, and I don't think we're unusual in the West, we're already in an economy that is transitioning out of natural resource extraction. So when we think about that sustainable energy, we're thinking about the impact on the environment. I'm also thinking about sustainability in, in terms of our state budget. So we know in natural resource development, we always have the boom and we are always have the bust. So as we've seen just natural market pressures really pushing in and a positive way to really impact natural resource extraction and its relationship with energy, it is having an impact on our state budget. And we want to keep that transition on a healthy transition. We want to be able to continue the investments that have already been made. We want to leverage those. And we think about it in terms of the interests of our citizens. And we think about them as citizens who are really caring about what's happening in their environment and their state economy. But also we think about that as our rate payers. Um, and how are we helping to inspire and continue policy that is protecting them and their interests. And so luckily the hard work that has happened in the sustainable, sustainable energy sector has really supported bringing that price down. It is competitive and so even if we only thought about it as a market protection piece, it really is something that's in the best interest of our citizens. We also think about it in terms of jobs. So as we look at this recovery, we think about jobs. I wanna be thinking about jobs all over the state. And the exciting aspect of this industry have, has really been the ability to have jobs that are more spread across the state as opposed to in just one or two communities. Even though I wanna be mindful of those communities, we wanna look at an industry that can really help support people across the state. And so why is it that you are uniquely positioned for that? And I will say looking at, you know, just having a quick look at who's on and seeing some of my own constituents and knowing how committed and really active they are already, I'm going to assume that everyone on this call is already that active. You already care, you're already paying attention, you're already knowledgeable, you've already lifted your voices, and I'm assuming you've done it repeatedly. And so even if you only take this away as, as, as really hearing it works, it's important, it's impactful, we'll leave it there. But what I know is that um, when there's an important 
distinction to be made for constituents versus advocates. So for legislators like me, we rely heavily on the advocates, just as you do. They inform, they help frame the conversation, they're bringing the data to the table. And like you heard today, they really are the experts that are positioning people to be able to best tell their story. But really when it comes to telling that story, Legislators on both sides of the aisle are going to tell you that they're going to pay more attention when they hear from a constituent, when they hear from a person in their community, in their state, who's closest to the impacts of the policy that they're thinking about. And so it's important that you continue to keep that pressure on, whether it's by a letter, whether it's through calls, whether it's showing up in committee rooms. Um, those are the things that people are looking for. And when you share it publicly, when you do it in places like letters to the editor, what we know that you're doing is that you're not only helping to signal support in the community that decision makers are looking towards, but you're also helping to craft and share the message with your neighbors. And so that as they end up in conversation or taking their own action, you've helped to frame that message for them as well. And then lastly, when you lift your voice, for those of us who are out there on the front lines, particularly in redder states and are maybe having to fight some of those policy fights uphill, your support behind us is what really is critical to being able to help us go in in good faith and know that this is something that our citizens care about. So it's powerful for us to be in those conversations when we know that we're talking to bodies who have also heard from other people as well. And so lastly, why is this a critical moment? So just thinking about um, why we really at the state level are still mindful of the importance of federal investment. So a big part of that, I think um, you, you heard it a, a little bit of what we've talked about today, but I think also a lot of people here know is there's such an incredible interconnected of our energy system. So when we talk about it at the state level, we have to be mindful of the different aspects that are impacting our systems that are really crossing state lines, that are really impacting at a regional level and also thinking about things like grid stability nationwide. And so we just can't do that our own and in order to really be able to craft that message and be able to do the work that we need to do on the ground we need when it's the bigger issues we need the bigger shoulders to be putting on the wheel and then I think lastly it's really thinking about sometimes it is those pieces that are at the bigger level and are maybe the less visible and more wonky but are really critical and because they're not right on the ground in front of us they sometimes are the pieces where we can have a really great impact because it isn't quite as contentious so i think about things like net metering in our state it's closest to a lot of our um, citizens right they can they can see the solar panels on a neighbor's house and they understand that relationship it's also super contentious it's a fight that we're constantly having to fight and reframe but there can be other aspects that are really critical to really thinking about how we move this forward on a system level that aren't as visible and when we can really help to lend our voice to those on the national level sometimes we can see the greatest impact there so I will leave it there for time, but I look forward to being able to engage more as we hear questions. Thank you so much, Lori, that um, I will I'll get my video up again. Um, thank you so much. That's very, very helpful. Um, so we have some time here for some questions for our panelists. Um, the way we're going to do this, because we have like 75 people on this thing. So um, the way we're going to do it is that if you have a question, type it into the chat box and I'll be moderating that. Um, so type your, your question in. Um, hopefully we get uh, actual questions, not this is more of a comment than a question. Um, but if you could type up your question and also indicate who it's directed to, if it's directed to one of our panelists. Um, so yeah, if you guys just want to take a moment and uh, type in what you're, what you're uh, wondering about what you've been thinking about while we've been hearing from our great panelists. Um, I think we have one question that's already come in from Eileen um, and she asked, how do we encourage more community solar? I'm going to kick that to um, Mike first. Um, if you want to take that away first, Mike. Absolutely. So here in Colorado, we have a community solar program. It's a state statute requires that our investor-owned utilities, that's primarily Excel and Black Hills Energy, 
have a community solar program. Um, so every couple of years, we go before the Public Utility Commission and argue uh, that there is a, a need for an expansion for community solar. This last uh, year, in fact, with the 2020 and 2021 program, will go from about 40 megawatts to 75 megawatts. We were able to do that by showing there was just overwhelming demands. We had, uh, we've been doing this for 11 years now, so we had a lot of history to show there's overwhelming demand. So that's the first place to go to is, is if, if you have an existing program uh, under statute in your state, you know, you want to go to the commission and show how much demand there is. If you don't have a statute, it may be very useful to talk to your state reps and your state senators to talk about creating uh, a community solar program. For those of you that are served by co-ops, um, either go get elected to the board or talk to your board member um, because co-ops are kind of, they do their own thing and uh, you just, uh, you need, need to say, I'm a member and this is what I want and, you know, get half a dozen of your neighbors to do the same thing. And before you know it, there'll be a two megawatt project uh, popping up in your community. Um, so the same thing goes with municipalities as well. If you have a municipal utility and you're served by them, those municipal utilities and uh, co-ops are really some of the easiest places to put uh, put your finger on the on the scale and make those happen. But it doesn't happen without you saying, I want more of it, I want more of it, I want more of it. I, I will finish up by saying, if you can find someone who has, uh, is either a renter or has a house that is kind of suboptimal for solar and, and would be willing to go on the record and say, I would, I would take more community solar, I would subscribe if I could, um, those are better advocates than uh, someone who has a kind of a suburban or, or rural home with a lot of uh, space on their roof uh, for, for solar. They kind of, you know, Sort of rings a little hollow so uh, i would go there and you know great places to go or find some active college students they are smart uh you know engaged and often don't own their own home so they're a perfect candidate for this all right so this next question is for brett and this is how can clean energy jobs help with the coal transition or the transition away from coal well i think like we're, we're seeing Ultimately, the economics are not, not playing in favor of coal. You know, in, in my community, we're looking at, or in the Navajo Nation, the Four Corners region, you're looking at eight gigawatts of, of coal-fired power that is going to go offline over the next decade. Some of it very, very prematurely. And I think creation of those jobs is actually going to be ultra important in order to keep people, you know, back to work. But the other is also to start us thinking about some of the supply chain aspects. I saw one comment in the chat about like, um, you know, why, why wasn't the discussion around why in, uh, pollution being more effect, more of a problem for COVID. And, and, and that was one thing we realized here on the Navajo Nation is one of the reasons we were more infected is we are coal communities. So we had people with more respiratory problems. We had people who had been, you know, working in these mines, working in these plants. We have pollution issues. And so the infection rate was a lot higher because the workforce was definitely at a disadvantage. And so I think like one of the things is the promotion of like healthier jobs and, and jobs that actually don't, you know, necessarily put hazard into um, some of the operations. And, and I think like that's something we're looking at as well is how can we create opportunities that don't have human costs and don't have like community costs because the thing is with, with anything that we do, um, we have to make sure that we're not creating sacrifice zones. And that's what we feel like we've been when fossil fuels came out to these areas. And we want to kind of promote that by saying like solar can be something that is scalable. You can start as small as a house or as big as a city or as big as a state. You know, and those are all things that allow us to like create a varying level of like, you know, um, jobs and, and economic opportunities. And that's why, you know, we're, we're doing what we're doing. Thank you. Um, so this next question comes from Mike and it is uh, for Susan at E2. Um, and he asks, what are the areas of low hanging fruit, especially in the Intermountain West, to stimulate clean jobs and create traction for the idea of the green energy recovery? Um, well, thanks for that question. There's, um, I could probably easier, since I don't know which state you're from, I can tell more about um, federal legislation that will, I think, impact everybody across the Mountain West 
and some of them were listed. Um, and also Mike also talked about like the ITC, the investment tax credit. There's also the um, production tax credit. Um, they, they need to extend the date by about a year when they start to phase down because of all these delays, um, a lot of the economic, um, uh, the, the, the incentives, if the incentives aren't part of the um, financing, the financing falls apart. There's also um, direct payments, an incentive reimbursement program like section 1603, that was from uh, 2009, where clean energy developers um, rather, instead of waiting for their tax returns to get filed, they can actually get payments delivered directly. That kind of bridges the uh, financial gap. Um, so there's, um, there's just a lot of ones that um, probably Kate will share in a follow-up. They're, they're also in that letter that you have as background material. Um, and what I think, the other thing that I feel like is often overlooked is energy efficiency. Um, throughout the West, throughout rural um, parts of the states, because everybody has old buildings that need to be upgraded. It not only provides jobs to do the energy efficiency upgrades, but it of course saves everybody money. And it, if you're using coal to heat your house or natural gas, you're also reducing the amount of um, energy you're using. So it's like a win-win-win. And I, I always feel like um, those are very overlooked um, jobs. Um, and uh, I think what supports some of those jobs is programs like C-PACE, commercial PACE, which uh, some states have, Colorado has. But if you're interested in learning more, just do uh, commercial PACE and you'll learn a lot about why these financing mechanisms really support um, driving uh, energy efficiency upgrades, which of course drives jobs. That's great, thank you. I think this will be our last question here. Um, it's kind of a two-parter. It's for Lori. This is from Joan, and then I'll sort of, um, I will add on my own little two-part to it. Um, she says, Lori, by contentious, do you mean creating conflict between citizens or conflict at the state house and between legislators? For instance, I haven't seen much to indicate that regular citizens are having conflict about net metering. Um, and my little follow-up is, if you could explain why net metering is really important for rooftop solar, um, especially in our states, that'd be great. Sure, um, yeah, so, and I tried to put a little answer there too, because I also saw some questions about like, what would be less contentious? And so definitely the, the, the tension that I'm referencing is more between legislators and even thinking about how industry can show up. So where we, sort of have to fight some of those fights in the state of Montana around net metering and trying to expand and um, say increase the size of um, the amount that can be generated. And so um, so we, yeah, I would I would agree. I don't see that being contentious on the ground. I see it contentious in the in the committee room. And um, and so thinking about the importance of it for us is that it really is a way to achieve meeting the demand that we really know exists in the community, both at the, at, you know, when we think about how we can put this on commercial buildings. So we have tried running both PACE and CPACE in, in Montana. Um, so it's a way of really driving that and bringing people's attention, you know, similar to when we think about community solar projects, that they really bring people's attention to, um, to solar and renewable energy and the, the role that it can play in their community. Um, so we want to be able to try to meet those needs in ways that aren't as tension filled. So um, when we're able to look at things like resource planning that happens more at the utility level, sometimes that's sort of coming a little bit in the back door because it isn't the thing that we're sort of more caught in the fights about in the committee room. Awesome. Awesome. So um, I'm going to make sure that we have enough time here um, to kind of cover our action steps uh, at the very end here. So thank you so much to our panelists. Um, you guys really illuminated with so much expertise a lot of the issues of uh, the clean energy recovery. Um, 
I really imagine everybody on this call now or on this webinar is super jazzed up um, and you guys are ready to knock down the doors of Congress and actually start fighting for this amazing clean energy future that we've been talking about today. So that's why we have put together an action page where you can quickly sign up to take action and advocate directly for a green energy recovery. So on this page, um, you're gonna find four easy actions. And don't worry, we are going to send you um, all of this, well, we're gonna send you the link to, to the action page in our follow-up email for all the attendees. Um, we're also going to paste the link in the chat box so you can even like go there now if you're like impatient. Um, but on the action page, we have four simple actions you can take. So the first one is writing a letter um, or an, it's actually an email to your member of Congress. So our system is super simple. We provide the sample letter language and all you have to do is add your name and your zip code and it's going to email directly email directly to your senators and representatives. Um, so our sample letter advocates for very simple things that we feel that this Congress could actually pass currently. And so those things are expanding and extending the tax incentives for clean energy. That means extending like the investment tax credit for energy and ex or for solar energy and expanding it to make sure it includes um, storage. Also supporting energy efficiency incentives and ensuring that low income households have access to renewable energy and energy efficiency upgrades. So these are all simple things, like I said, that we feel like this Congress could achieve. Um, it'd be really simple from our action page. You can uh, edit the letter in any way that you want. Um, and it's gonna go directly to your representatives. So the second action we take um, that you have here is sending a comment uh, to FERC, which is the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Right now there's a petition before them to, um, to, kill, um, to kill net metering, essentially. It would totally reverse the pricing structure that makes net metering affordable. And that's the thing that allows rooftop solar to actually like make financial sense. This is a really, really egregious assault. It takes away state, the state pricing structure um, that's enacted in 41 states. Um, and so this is really a very simple thing you can do. So you can go and sign our petition and tell them to tell FERC to defend net metering. Um, again, super simple step from our action page. The next thing is, um, well, writing a letter to the editor. So I'm gonna allow um, Eric Warren to describe this one. He's our social media comms guy. So he gets this stuff more than I do. Yeah, we've found that uh, elected officials really pay attention to letters to the editor. Um, uh, um, we have a sign-on form in, the, in our action page, which the link is now in the chat. Um, and if you sign in there, we'll email you tips and sample language so it's really easy to write one and send it to your local paper. Um, and then another thing that would really help is to share this with five of your friends. Um, Email the action page link to friends or family, um, and then also sharing it on social media with the hashtag green energy future. All those things can be really helpful to getting the word out. Yeah, thank you, Eric. Um, so the last thing here is that we would love for you guys to um, commit now, commit today, like right now, while your energy is high, while you're jazzed up, uh, to commit to one of these actions or two of these actions or three of them or all four of them. So if everybody could just take a moment and get into the chat box and let us know what you can commit to doing. Again, it's all through the action page. It's super simple. So um, let us know what you think that you can uh, commit to. And I don't know if as these come in, we might read a few out loud. Okay, we've got one, two, and four. Let's see, Kathleen will uh, write to FERC on net metering. It's freaking awesome. That's great. Anyone else? Michael says that he'll do one and two for sure. Emailing your congressional representatives and telling FERC to defend net metering. This is great. All right, we've got 
Andrea, who will commit to one and two, which is awesome. One thing about the letter to the editor, we're going to have sample language um, for you guys to use and a handy how-to guide. Um, it is really, really uh, pretty impressive how much federal representatives actually pay attention to these letters to the editor. Um, they don't, <laughs> it's more, it's surprising how much it, it registers with them. So Betsy says that she would write a letter to the editor. That's great. Joan has already contacted you, FERC, but she will do more. All right. And some other people are sharing the FERC request. All right. Let's just get a few more in here. Barbara said that she would share it with five more people. This is great. And Elaine said she would do one in five as well. This is great. Doug says he'll share it with five more people as well. All right, you guys, I want to thank you all for participating in our webinar um, and for, uh, for sticking with us for an hour. I know it's hard when we're all zoomed out, but it's really, really incredible what we can be doing together. Um, there is so much promise in a green energy recovery. And I think this, our amazing speakers and everybody who is participating today shows us how much energy there is here. So we will be in touch with all of you guys. We're gonna help you take those next actions. Um, and then as the time comes, you know, there's gonna be follow-up. This isn't just a one and done. Uh, we, have to keep, we have to keep the pressure on. So I trust that we can all do it together. So I really appreciate everyone for coming. I really appreciate our panelists. Thanks so much and let's win this green energy recovery. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye.